operating or owing an executive aircraft, which can fly where and when he wants to, frequently to and from smaller airfields that are not regularly served by any maintenance facility, poses the challenge of keeping flightability and maintainability updated. Long journeys, overnight stops and remote airports where maintenance support is not ready to cope with a particular need may render a late takeoff or even cancel a flight. Before scheduling a flight, monitoring maintenance requirements is the best solution to avoid surprises. This video will get you, pilot or owner, an extended view of some procedures that must be timely carried out to suit maintenance requirements. The procedures contained in this video are derived from the Aircraft Maintenance Manual and the Operations Manual and should be used as a means of demonstrating how to properly accomplish the job. Remember that only qualified personnel are authorized to carry out maintenance procedures, as stated in regulations. Be sure to comply with your local regulatory authority. You will notice that some of the tasks shown here are part of the pilot's walk-around. They are restated here with such an amount of details as to make this video useful for the pilot to brief maintenance personnel for proper supporting. There are some messages that must be checked on the MFD. Actually, you must check that these messages are not there, as they assign a failure condition. Of course, the aircraft should be energized and the CMC operating. To scan the messages, select the maintenance page on the captain's MFD. Make sure that the CMC FADEC input fail and the engine oil debris messages are not displayed. These messages should be checked each 50 flying hours on the aircraft equipped with A1P engine and 70 hours on the A1E engines. If you see the engine oil debris message, takeoff is not allowed. Call for maintenance support in case you see any of these messages displayed. The engine oil is checked as necessary. To check the level, open the proper access cover. Check the sight glass and add oil if necessary. You can check oil level either prior to the first flight of the day or at intermediate flights. Prior to the first flight of the day, fill the engine oil tank until the oil reaches the one quart mark on the sight gauge. For flights other than the first flight of the day, when the quantity is below the three quart mark on the sight gauge, Fill the oil tank until the oil reaches the two-quart mark on the sight gauge. Remember that the engine temperature stays high after the engine stops. Wait until the engine cools down before servicing it. To add oil, remove the filler cap from the engine oil tank. Visually inspect the oil tank for signs of leakage around the filler cap. Do a visual inspection of the O-ring for cuts, cracks or damage. Replace the O-ring if necessary. Lubricate the O-ring before reinstalling the filler cap. Record the volume of oil added to the engine oil tank in the maintenance record. Use approved oils only. Install the filler cap back in place and make sure that it is properly installed. Oil tank servicing is done through the access at the aircraft tail cone, which provides access to a sight glass and an oil filler cap. The sight glass is a full indication which must be never exceeded. Be sure to reinstall the oil filler cap and to close the access after refilling. As for the engines, use only approved oils and make sure the APU is sufficiently cool to be touched. Gain access through the panel located after the wing fairing on both sides of the aircraft. Fully release the pressure of the hydraulic system through the oil discharge valve for system 1. 
It also applies for the emergency parking brake of System 2. On the hydraulic fluid level indicator, make sure the needle pointer is between the 4.5 and 5.5 liter marks, normal range. The shaded region is the dispatchability range. If the pointer is below the refill mark, fill the reservoir until you have the correct full level mark using a hydraulic reservoir service unit. Remove the cap of the replenishing set. Install the auxiliary hose of the hydraulic reservoir service unit to the fitting of the inlet line, but keep the connections loose. Put a drip pan at the connection between the auxiliary hose of the hydraulic reservoir service unit and the fitting of the inlet unit. Operate the hand pump of the unit until the small amount of free air hydraulic fluid is drained through the connection to the drip pan. This will make sure that the air and the auxiliary hose is eliminated. Tighten the connection between the auxiliary hose and the fitting of the inlet line. Fill the reservoir unit until it is full. Then remove the hose from the inlet fitting and install the cap on the inlet line fitting on the reservoir. After refilling the reservoir, it is still required to bleed air from the reservoir. Make sure that the hydraulic fluid level in the reservoir is correct. Close the hydraulic fluid reservoir access panel. The main and nose landing gear shock absorber sometimes must be filled with nitrogen through a charging valve installed at the landing gear. Filling pressure is a function of the piston height as checked in the following charts. There are separate charts for nose and main landing gears. Make sure that the emergency parking brake is applied. To prevent hydraulic fluid transfer from System 1 to System 2 or vice versa, First apply brakes with the pedals and pull or release the emergency parking brake handle. Make sure that the landing gear safety pins are installed on the right hand and left hand main landing gear. Connect the hose of the hydrogen cylinder to the filling charging valve. Adjust the pressure regulator valve to zero PSI. Open the filling charging valve. Open the nitrogen cylinder valve. To increase the pressure of the shock absorber, open the pressure regulator valve until the shock absorber piston starts its movement. On the pressure gauge, read and record the pressure value. On the servicing chart, identify the curve that is nearest to the ambient temperature. With the pressure value found in the curve identified, Read on the servicing chart and record the piston height value H applicable to these data. Continue to fill with nitrogen until the shock absorber piston height is at the recorded value. Wait 3 minutes for the stabilization and then see that the piston height is equal to the written value. If necessary, correct. Close the filling charging valve. Close the nitrogen cylinder valve. Remove the hose from the filling charging valve. Inspect the filling charging valve for leakage. Inspect the height of the other main landing gear shock absorber. If necessary, do the charging procedure. Install the safety pin on the nose landing gear door solenoid valve. Make sure the nose landing gear safety pin is installed on the nose landing gear. Make sure the nose landing gear steering is in the neutral zero degree steering position. Connect the hose of the nitrogen cylinder to the charging valve. Adjust the pressure regulator valve to zero PSI. Open the nitrogen cylinder valve. With the charging valve open, increase the pressure of the shock absorber opening pressure regulator valve until the shock absorber piston starts its movement. On the pressure gauge, read and write the pressure value. On the servicing chart, identify the curve that is nearest to the ambient temperature. With the pressure value found in the curve identified, read and write the piston height value H applicable to these data. 
continue to fill with nitrogen until the shock absorber piston height is equal to the written value. If necessary, correct. Close the charging valve. Close the nitrogen cylinder valve. Remove the hose from the charging valve. Inspect the charging valve for leakage. Remove the safety pin of the nose landing gear door solenoid valve. <laughs> tire pressure 84 plus or minus 2 psi main tire pressure 160 plus or minus 4 psi before each flight check the wheels and tires for condition temperatures at departure and destination airports must be checked if a large temperature decrease between the temperature and the destination airports is observed equal to or greater than 25 degrees Celsius 54 degrees Fahrenheit, the tire pressure must be adjusted considering the colder airport and the following procedure must be accomplished. Increase the tire pressure 1% for each 3 degrees Celsius, 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, of temperature difference. Brake wear indicator positions must be inspected with the brake pressurized. Brake applied. Inspect the brake wear indicators for visible cracks. Inspect the brake wear indicator length. The length of the brake wear indicator for a new brake is 22.86 millimeters, 0 0.90 inches. When the indicator rod is flat with the hexagonal insert, the brakes are fully worn out and should be replaced. If one or more of the brake wear indicators do not come out of the piston housing, the brake assembly must be replaced. The oxygen system is filled from an external service panel located on the right side of the aircraft nose. The service panel is common for the crew oxygen system and the passenger oxygen system. It has independent fill valve and pressure gauges for each system. A 50 cubic foot crew oxygen cylinder and one or two 77 cubic foot passenger oxygen cylinders are installed on the right side of the partition between the cockpit and the passenger cabin for use in an emergency. The crew and passenger cylinder pressure can be checked on the MFDs on the service panel. The minimum oxygen pressure for dispatch is as shown. Dispatching pressures were calculated for an ambient temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. For other temperatures, check the proper correction chart. Filling operation is carried out as follows. Remove the protection cap from the passenger crew system charging valve. Connect the oxygen cylinder adapter to the hose of the oxygen service regulator. Connect the oxygen service regulator to the oxygen source. For aircraft under the FAA configuration, fill the passenger oxygen system with aviators breathing oxygen only. Connect the oxygen charger adapter to the passenger crew system charging valve and make sure that there is no leakage. The system filling pressure is 1850 psi at a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. For other temperature values, refer to the appropriate correction tables. Immediately after you close the oxygen service regulator, open the oxygen cylinder shutoff valve. Fill the system slowly and gradually in increments of 100 psi to prevent heating in the system and thus an incorrect pressure indication. Slowly open the oxygen service regulator and let the system fill up to the recommended pressure. Monitor the passenger crew system pressure gauge of the servicing panel and the oxygen service regulator. Close the oxygen cylinder shutoff valve. Carefully remove the oxygen charger adapter from the passenger system charging valve to release the remaining pressure and the hose. 
High pressure oxygen can cause sudden combustion by contact with oil, trees, solvents, hydrocarbons in general, cloth, fibers, metal chips, etc. Only qualified personnel must handle and service the oxygen equipment. Towing is normally accomplished by using ground support equipment, tow bar and tow bar head attachment, coupled to the landing gear. Towing without the tow bar is prohibited, except for Airplanes Postmod Service Bulletin 145LG320025 or equipped with an equivalent modification factory incorporated that can be towed using a tow barless tug vehicle and respective procedures specified in the AMM Chapter 9. The following precautions apply when towing the airplane. Tow the airplane with hydraulic system 1 and 2 depressurized. If it is necessary to tow the aircraft with hydraulic system 1 pressurized, do not actuate the steering. In case it is suspected that the emergency parking brake has no accumulator charge to supply power for a needed actuation, Turn electric hydraulic pump number two for a few seconds and then turn it off again. Disengage the steering system through the steering disengage button located on the control wheel, pilot or co-pilot. The steering enop message appears on the ICAS. During the towing operations, a person properly trained must stay in the cockpit to set the emergency parking brake if necessary. Towing operation is accomplished following the steps below. Remove the lock pin from the guide pin on the tow bar assemblies. Install tow bar on the nose landing gear. Put the guide pin in the towing point of the nose landing gear. Lock the guide pin with a lock pin. Install the other side of the tow bar assemblies to the tractor. Remove the wheel chocks. Release the emergency parking brake. After the towing operation is finished, apply the emergency parking brake or install the wheel chocks as required. Make sure the landing gear safety pins are correctly installed. Make sure the nose wheel displacement are below the maximum operational limit. Remove the tow bar. Remove the lock pin from the guide pin on the tow bar assembly. Remove the guide pin from the towing point of the nose landing gear. Remove the tow bar assembly from the nose landing gear. Make sure the landing gear safety pins are correctly installed. The instructions cover only the normal parking. It means parking between flights and overnights. In case of parking in an extremely adverse weather condition, see the AOM Chapter 1-12, Page 4, Cold Soak Preparation, and watch the video OV-135BJ005, Legacy Cold Weather Operation. A minimum clearance from other airplanes must be observed to allow the airplane free maneuvering movements. At least 4.5 meters, 15 feet, Clearance from the APU exhaust to the adjacent airplane fuel tank vent must be observed too. If the wind is higher than 65 knots, the airplane must be sheltered into a hangar. Make sure the landing gear safety pins are installed. If the safety pin is not installed, injuries to people or damage to the airplane can occur. Before parking the airplane, move it approximately 3 meters in a straight line to remove all torsion stress applied to the landing gear components and tires during towing turns. Ground the airplane. If the brakes are excessively hot, do not apply the parking brakes until they cool down to prevent the brake discs from bonding. Set the emergency parking brake. Retract the flaps if they are extended. Set the gust lock lever. Put the chocks against the landing gear wheels. To prevent the curtsy light from discharging the battery, trip the curtsy light A22 circuit breaker. 
Install the covers to the pitot tubes. Total air temperature sensor. Ice detector. Engine APU, air intakes and exhaust nozzles. And anemometrical static ports. Remove the chocks from the landing gear wheels. Remove the covers from the pitot tubes, ice detector, TAT sensor, engine APU air intakes and exhaust nozzles, and anemometrical static ports. Make sure the control handle of the landing gear is in the down position. Make sure the safety pins are installed to each landing gear. Make sure the safety pins are removed before taxiing the airplane for takeoff. Unground the airplane. Release the emergency parking brake. Release the gust lock lever.